Good morning, dear participants, dear guests, and dear speakers of the session designed for all livable public spaces. Um, so today um, we are missing two speakers, so I will have more time for my speakers who are present here. But uh, to also have time for the Q&A session, I will only give them 20 minutes for their speeches, and then we will continue with the Q&As. About the questions and answers part, actually this organization has worked really hard about it, and two of our speakers have already um, built up their questionnaires, which you can find on the application of Marmara Urban Forum. Marmara Urban Forum's application is actually here written at the back of your name tags. If you can please download the application and connect to Wi-Fi to, through the um, Marmara Urban Forum's Wi-Fi connection, you can actually answer the questions of both Mahyar Arafi and Aisha Sama Kubat. Mahyar Arafi wanted me to announce that it is very important that you answer his questionnaire before he starts his speech because he doesn't want you to get biased by his uh, presentation. Uh, Aisha Sema Kubat also wants you to answer her um, questionnaire during her presentation because the answers that you will give will be the result, the conclusion of her speech. So thank you for your cooperation in this matter. Another announcement that I have to make is, besides these two questionnaires, which actually the presenters prepared themselves, there is also a question form in the uh, application, again, when you enter this session. Um, you can write your questions there if you don't want to raise your hand and also um, make comments or raise your questions uh, by voice. You can also write your questions there and the application will forward your questions to me afterwards. And when we enter the Q&A session, I will be selecting questions from there and um, just submit these questions to our presenters. So again, after these announcements, you are welcome. So not to steal too much time from the presenter's time, I am just going to make a very short introduction for each presenter and about their presentations, and I will give floor to them one by one. So the first speakers will be from London, who are Wakako Kishimoto and Mark L.A. Please come to the floor. I invite them to the floor for their speeches. They are the founders of L.A. Kishimoto, and L.A. Kishimoto has a desire to pattern the world, instill beauty, unite people with creative solutions and they are trying to put physical outputs, outputs since they opened their um, company, their studio, in 1992 in London. Known primarily as pattern makers, it was their seasonal fashion collections that gained them global notoriety. They are trying to dress the world in alternative ways by the maxim, print the world. Uh, their presentation's title, is addressing and dressing public space. They will be speaking about, here at Marmara Urban Forum, how they illustrate how they have approached work within the public realm with the same creative approach as for clothing. Thank you. There you go. Ooh. Hello, um, thank you very much for the invitation to uh, Marmara Urban Forum today. Um, it's, a, it's a pleasure to speak to you as designers, uh, perhaps which is a little bit more uh, light uh, and maybe flowery in terms of some of the very significant topics that I know that must be dealt with within these three days. Um, I'm Mark Ely and this is... Wakako Kishimoto. Um, and together we, we are Ivi Kishimoto. Do we have a slide? Yeah, I got yeah. Okay. Well, you wanted to. So. Um, could, could I just ask to change the slide? Is anybody in control of the slide? It doesn't work. Could we go to slide one, please?
excuse me. Okay, so Okay, so we, we fundamentally started as textile designers. Um, I graduated from Brighton University. I'm a weaver. Wakako is a printer, study at St. Martin's. Um, and our company was established in 1992. Um, fundamentally, we're surface decorators. Uh, we create patterns. Initially, that was for our friends, such as Alexander McQueen, Hussein Shalayan, um, and London designers who graduated the same time as us, which then progressed on to um, our own collections, uh, which allowed ourselves to play with patterns and narrative on a variety of, variety of garments and a variety of accessories. And at the same time to survive, we also work for European houses such as Marc Jacobs, Louis Vuitton, Albert Elbaz, Guy La Roche, Jill Sander, um, to enable ourselves to experience and also experiment with the idea of storytelling through pattern using color and space. Our fundamental USP is making very small repeating units. Quite quickly, this progressed into the idea of us relating to what we did, which is pattern making, which jumped away from the fashion arena because we saw ourselves a designer and the temporal effect of what fashion is, we thought we'd look, into, look at architecture, interior design, and then that also led us, led us into public space. And then also, I think that the power of pattern, as much as what you um, wear in, that explains that that's telling people about yourself. That's the first thing that you notice when you meet somebody, first, so, first of all, that um, we believe that applies the same as whether it's a building, uh, spaces, um, etc., room, interior. The, the, the, the print you're currently looking at is called um, Frill, and therefore the, the picture on the left with the, the, the landscape was an exhibition with architects, 6A architects, um, and it was called Frill in the City. And it was our first opportunity to try to start having a dialogue about actual making visual landmarks, which went beyond the fact of architectural kind of materiality. So therefore we were playing with the flippancy of fabric within, within the built environment. And as you can see, it jumps from dress to, to, to object within the home. And then similar with regards to the narrative, which is with, built within our fashion collections, this, this was a hairy wood which was built in the, in the public square in Covent Garden and also in Old Street. This was built in maybe, to, I think it's 1998 and 2004. Um, the story behind the fashion collection where the original print comes is something about Rapunzel, the idea of a, a tower where you let down your hair. So the narrative is very, very light to try to create aesthetics which actually have harmony, which also evoke nostalgia. Um, and the fact that having this conversation piece or a, a space where people can actually convene to sit, to watch, to fall in love, to be able to be participant within the urban environment was something where we wanted to start to have a voice, um, which goes beyond fashion. And we don't want to change the world. We, with this, we're working in a very much a micro way, looking at our own territory in London. And all the elements that we're designing are temporal. We're not making permanent statements because the world we live within now is very, very lateral in terms of time. We can't plan for more than five years. I know there's major, major commitments in terms of architectural master planning, but for us, our approach is very, very light. And I think that's what made us attractive to urban designers as well as architects working within the public realm. Okay, then looking at ways of working within the public space. It's the same as dressing women and men is the same as dressing the environment. We took no different attempt to change our conceptual, conceptual building and thought processes in terms of allowing our pattern making to become democratic, to be owned by the public, to allow them to evoke their own stories within in the environment that we're actually achieving these, these design applications. This was in Somerset House for the exhibition which related fashion and architecture called Skin and Bones. Basically, it was a, a launch party. These pieces of furniture were oversized. They were produced for the one particular opening evening and then were distributed
distributed all over UK in very specific sites such as Westminster, such as outside the Olympic Park, in Kings Road, in Sloan Square, which create a multitude of public spaces from one initial action. Um, the, the, the way that the prints hopefully create uh, a, a, a, an understanding of familiarity or ease was perhaps the way that when we started in 1992, we worked with an analogues, not within digital. So therefore, the aesthetics of that stage of our lives possibly was linked with industry. The idea of repeating units, the idea of commercialism. Um, so therefore, people of our generation, not so much the, the younger generation now, who's possibly used, much more used to visual images, which are pictures, there was something about that familiarity that we put within our work, which possibly made it more accessible to a wider public. Alongside all of this work which we're showing today, there's a multitude of, of, of collaborations, of licensing, of other productions, not just working within this arena. So these are just capturing our, our motive with regards to how we want to work with, within the public arena. Um, and also try to stimulate the idea of democratizing pattern to give our work to make it public ownership, not for us to be at the forefront. When people have egos within fashion, they are very much at the forefront and it's all about their own personal story. Our mission was the idea to give the story to the public and for them to take ownership of it, to give them a sense of place. It's about place making, it's about the idea of where you are within the environment and also memories. And those memories then come stories which they bring to the, bring to the work themselves. This was part of uh, Brixton Design Trail. We're from a South London district called Brixton, which is very much an area which has got a history of the, the, the, uh, the black cultural uh, destination from the 1950s with the Windrush. It is seen as a place maybe 20 years not to go to because of the demographic of the people living there. So, but we've been living there for 27 years ourselves. And so therefore we're very much engrossed in that, in that community. Our studios there, our children grew up there. So therefore it was only natural from our international work within fashion to reduce ourselves back to our home base and focus on that to have a micro influence for the macro reality. If we work like this locally, then I believe that globally, if people doing very similar things, then we have a chance to have a communication together which is a bit more harmonious in terms of our embracing of the people involving themselves within the public arena together through creativity and aesthetics. I this think when, when we chase the internationalism, globalism, sometimes one forgets what's happening outside your doorstep. And then that's when about the time that we started to realize and we want to make change what's happening outside our doorstep. Um, so from that very first intervention with regards to the, the, the more exhibition, the more gallery, to then looking at the public infrastructure, working with public transport, looking at building the identity of Brixton as a design destination, part of London Design Festival, then we had this, this notoriety that we wanted to be involved in this kind of work locally. So therefore we started to work with Transport for London, the local government, also the city, and created something from our own intelligence about pattern making and techniques, working with a Swedish infrastructure company, working with local authorities to produce patterning for roads, which combined the idea of safety, the idea of place making, and the idea of shared space in terms of making places much more healthy to live within. And this was, um, this, this was called Colourful Crossings. It's been a, a, a research that we've been doing for about seven or eight years now, and we've produced about nine different destinations. This is the one in Brixton, um, this is the one in the Barbican, working with um, the Barbican, London Symphony Orchestra, the City of London. The other one is working with British Rail and also with Coventry Council. Um, it's a thermoplastic, very simple technique which was used for common infrastructure purposes, such as uh, safety signs for cycling, pathways, etc. And we just manipulated the technique to allow ourselves to experiment with the fundamental 2D pattern making what we're so used to with regards to our fashioning. Without making the significant building, spending loads of um, uh, funding, etc. I mean, relatively with a low budget, just by applying surface decoration, certain area of London becomes somewhere special in somewhere that um, people talk about and somewhere that people kind of 
feel that's that, that's kind of our area. I think that's what, what we're trying to exercise here. Um, the empathy that we have um, with regards to this work going out into public ownership is that maybe upon the first visualization or interaction with the work, it does have initial impact, but very, very quickly it becomes a norm. So therefore this bright blue crossing with our pattern on starts to become the ownership of the people within the community and it's not ours anymore. Possibly out of all the work we've ever produced, the, these crossings in the Barbican, in Coventry, in Brixton, are things where people interact with our work far more than the things we physically design for people to wear. Um, and in terms of that, that's really truly democratizing pattern or democratizing creativity. The idea that we can possibly gift these ideas to the public and then they take ownership of it is, is the best part of our giving with our God's side creative work I can possibly think. Um, there's also a sense of um, our local community with regards to that micro and macro thinking. There's a windmill, the oldest building, which is 200 yards from our studio. Um, it needed to raise funds. We work with a local council. We produce beautiful sales uh, for the windmill um, with a sail maker who just did Louis Vuitton kind of sales for their sailboats in a traditional fashion. So therefore, we are empathetic with the state of the building itself. And this, again, is used for a marketing purpose to give a highlight to this building, which is an unknown treasure within the central London. It's only one of two windmills which exist. There's a huge community building around this, which is uh, to deal with education. We've taught over 2,000 primary school children between the age of four and 11 within the building that we've got. The Lambeth Council have taken that building away. We needed to raise over a quarter of a million to build a new education centre. And we were at the forefront with our links with architects, as well as then the local government in terms of raising those funds with the community support to create a building which can, which can cherish the idea of education from field to plate. And everything goes alongside this windmill in terms of architectural, the reason of its heritage, the idea of history, and also building up a sense of local belonging in, ser in terms of our community. And then again, that spreads not just within Brixton, but then it spreads a lot beyond London itself in the larger border territory. So taking ourselves away, we're jumping from community and public space. This is us now going back to our commercial work working with architects and master planners. When we start, we were a part of a team, Rambold, who did the planning for Olympicopolis, which was a, a space of land next to the Olympic Park in Stratford, where they were building uh, UAL, the London College of the Fashion, um, Smithsonian Museum, um, there was also the, v the new annex of the v &A Library, and we were part of the sensory panel. So we worked primarily trying to give all these buildings and the infrastructure a visual identity through design and pattern making that allowed the architects to play with our work to harmonize a certain look or color or feel to the space itself so the whole place was dealing with public space and public realm. So this was um, a design that we did for the urban development. Residential. Um, and these are the, the buildings working with uh, RCR Architects, Junior Ishigami, um, there's Rick Mather, and also Soil in New York. So each, each architect took, took one particular building and then worked with us, plus Ab Rogers, Abe Rogers' son, to look at giving them an identity, looking at the realm around the buildings, because obviously there's a passageways, there's thoroughfares, there's the relationship to, to, the, the, the, uh, to uh, the White City, the, the, uh, the, sorry, the shopping center, as well as the actual football stadium, which where the Olympics originally was held. And our work infiltrated all aspects of this, including the marking materials, the ideology of the senses. We brought two other collaborators from our portfolio, Daniel, Daniel Pemberton, who's a composer within, within films now, and also looked at the sensory aspect of sound. And also we worked with Cecil Toulis uh, from the International Perfume Federation in Berlin, who dealt with smell. So we were the visual aspect, which was look, smell and sound, and that was our portfolio, what we brought to the, to the, to the, to the work itself. Sorry. Um, again, this is looking at the, a private commission. We became brand ambassadors of the conversion of the tallest skyscraper within London that was built in 1950s by Seaford. 
Um, we were brought on initially to give flavour to the marketing booklet. But the stakeholders, again, the architects, the designers, the interior designers, the, the branding uh, people on project saw the ability of a simplicity of how we brought pattern to the project and manipulated that to give the sense a place of identity, which then penetrated through the materiality of the building, the temporal vista, because it was, had to be wrapped. And it's one of the largest wraps within London for, I think, the last 20 years. And then we produced fashion collections. We brought out a natural way of working, such as collaborating with Angle Poise, with Gilbert, with uh, the London buses, with taxis, to give it a sense of identity within the whole spectre of London. And um, it's to support the commercial development, rather than to really re uh, respect the public arena there. This, to us, was a job. It, we were doing the very similar thing to what we would do naturally to perhaps what we did in Brixton, but this supports our giving to our local community, which we give for free. This enables us to have the ideology of us as citizens within the environment taking care of our locality as a creator within Brixton. Um, the work that then this then perhaps goes into with regards to thinking about public space is the commercial area at the ground level, it's a thoroughfare, it's a passage in the centre of London by Tottenham Court Road. That is a space for all. That was a place perhaps where we could possibly give some kind of aesthetic to give it a sense of memory of the past from the 1950s, 60s, when the actual building was originally designed to the contemporary and also the future, to allow it to have, o to have, it have open access for all. Um, and this leads us into something that was very prevalent to what we're doing locally, back into Brixton now, with a certain group. This is us working within the community again with Marcus Lipton Centre. Um, as well as we both um, teach in a higher education uh, institution, um, when we talk about the uh, public space, and public space is a public space, it's for everybody. But Unfortunately, there are some communities which is not included. Public spe uh, space need to include everybody. Um, but these kids in this center, a lot of them, they even feel themselves they're not included in the space. So they don't even participate in, in terms of a planning or anything. So we, we are just um, designers, but we just uh, want them to have a voice um, through um, us teaching them um, the craft of designing, pattern making, or some kind of confidence through learning some, some skill of designing. I mean, that's a sort of a little way of that we do in it, but we, our hope is that they can be in the space, they have a voice um, through the, the learning of design. So, in summary, um, yeah, I know. decorators. We just create patterns, small repeating units that can cover the world. We're, we are not, we're not shy of working beyond the realms of what we feel is natural to us, which is fabric. We allow ourselves to think as designers within the community to embrace the issues and also the ideologies of creating something which we feel is beautiful to make the world a prettier and more harmonious place. We have narrative within our work, which is stories, and we believe everybody else within the room has these creative stories to tell. We tell it locally, and hopefully that can influence people internationally with their own stories, with some sort of similar understanding that we are a community and we need to share this space. If we can do it by aesthetics to create memories or nostalgia, then our mission is accomplished. Even for that one person to think back when they were 13 or 12 or 6, I was there, I can remember that, that makes me feel this way. That's our challenge with our aesthetics and the world that we work within. Thank you very much. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you very much for your interesting um, speech where you underlined that fashioning public space enables placemaking and democratizing pattern is the core of what you are doing. Thank you again for your presentation. So now I will give floor to Professor Dr. Ayşe Sema Kubat for her speech. Um, she is a professor of urban and regional planning at Istanbul Technical University. 
probably most of you know already. Um, I, it, it will take too much time to introduce her, so I will just focus on some um, awards that she got. She was granted the Honorary Award in 2009 by Global Center of Excellence, program extension of Center for Sustainable Urban Regeneration, and within the scope of 101 women with golden signatures, she was awarded as the Woman Scholar of 2010 in Architectural Sciences. Um, she is today going to make us a speech on transformation of a public square from a political center to a transportation hub, which is in Taksim, and she will also talk about Geza Park. So just a, a brief uh, introduction of her speech again. Taksim has played a very important role uh, throughout history, um, as probably, again, most of you know. And today, Professor Dr. Kubat will present a morphological survey on the transformation process of this area, which turned from an urban fringe to the political heart, then to the public transportation hub of the metropolitan Istanbul. The floor is yours, Hojan. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh uh, for your nice explanation. Uh, I, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Maruf for organizing such a, a conf uh, successful conference and inviting them, invi inviting me to this conference. Yes, I will talk about uh, a, a space which is very, very, which you are all very familiar with, uh, Taksim Square and Gezi Park. Uh, it is, uh, this project is from a scientific project which I uh, worked for years with my uh, PhD students and with uh, master students. Uh, so it's about transformation of a political center to a transportation hub. Yes, uh, let's see now. It, this, this study provides a comparative analysis of a major urban design intervention that was implemented uh, in Taksim Square in Istanbul and links spatial analysis with pedestrian movement observations to evaluate three conditions in Taksim Square in relation to the urban design intervention. In its original condition, I mean the old condition, there was mixed vehicle and pedestrian tra traffic, and during the construction, uh, pedestrian movement channel to the surrounding pathways, and after the completion of I said urban design, but it wasn't an urban design project, it's, but it was a transportation project. At, and this was the square was freed, yeah, now it is freed from vehicular traffic. Uh, my study aims to contribute to further the knowledge about design planning interventions in central public spaces and how these may affect movement and vitality. Uh, well, so let's see, what's Taksim? It is the main center of entertainment, retail and cultural activities. It is a connection node between the old and new central business district of Istanbul, the host of major social events and the direct subject of, of, of some of these events. The subject of debates on account of its unresolved unre pedestrian and vehicular traffic. Okay, uh, everybody knows where Taksim is located, but let's just have a look for the ones who never uh, visited Taksim Square, uh, who are the visitors today for this conference. Okay, the Taksim uh, is on the connection road between old CBD, Eminönü, historical peninsula, to the new CBD of Istanbul. Uh, you can have a look, uh, and uh, we have Yes, the, uh, the traffic is some, uh, just a schematic uh, uh, explanation of the traffic. And uh, Taksim Square and Gezi Park. These are the uh, areas that really very close to the site we have this conference. Okay, so motivation, what happened? In September 2011, Taksim pedestrianization project was approved by the municipality and construction of an underground tunnel system for vehicles which would leave the surface above as a pedestrian only platform. And observations, and there were some questions before we started our study. A higher number of pedestrians began using Easy Park when the construction of the Taksim project was commenced. Expectations 
This project would favorably affect the pedestrian volume in Taksim Square and Gezi Park. Outcome, the three-phase research that utilizes the space syntax method to test the observations and expect expectations. And uh, this is a methodology because of the time constraint. I'm not going to talk about it, but it was also explained in one of the previous uh, sections by Tim Stoner. Space syntax method enabled the quantification of the data and provided a systematic approach to make comparison. Okay, so phase one. Uh, what we did, we just count the, uh, we just analyzed the urban structure before the implementation of the pedestrianization project during the construction and after the implementation of this project. Uh, tasks, uh, first we have research on spatial history of Taksim, then analysis of the spatial configuration and pedestrian observations. We had some gates and we count how many people are using these gates. They are shown on red and comparison of the spatial analysis and pedestrian movement data. All of these data were created and they were overlapped in different maps. So let's say the history of Taksim. Uh, Taksim Square and its vicinity have undergone a lot of morphological changes. Uh, with a spatial, political and economic transformation of the city, it has changed a lot. So let's see, uh, be before 1920s, between 1920 and 1940, uh, so uh, after 1940 and 60, uh, the barrack was uh, removed and Talimhane district was created, 60 and 80, and between 80 and 2000, uh, it was analyzed and 2000 to date. Let's have a look. Before 1920, it was a, a the first uh, construction of Taksim began in 1950s, 20s. Uh, it was an open space. Uh, the location of the construction of the military uh, structures came at that time, and Topçu Kışla barrack and the soldier uh, hospital were also, and Taş Kışla building were all built at that time. In 19... Uh, 20, again, uh, these structures were there, and there was a, a Republic monument was e created, and it, there was a ring, uh, round space, was created to host ceremonies and to flow, to allow ve vehicular traffic. In 1940s, uh, Taksim Barrack was demolished, and Gezi Park was uh, designed in its place. And at that time, there is a big significant, uh, we can say that a significant configuration changed the structure of the city. And uh, 1960 and 80, we have so many hotels, Sheraton, Marmara, Atatürk Cultural Center, and so on. And at that time, also a Republic Monument lost its grandeur. In 1980 to 2000, Tarlabaşı Boulevard was created and a, a new hotel region around this area was cre created, and we can talk about renewal of, oh, I'm sorry. I'm going back. Okay, and renewal of Talimhane was at that date. Yes, if you just look uh, on the other scale, a bigger scale, uh, the there, there is a pri pri privatization in the park area, and Henry Prost in 1940s, he uh, created a park, uh, the green area, and he connected uh, Gizi Park to the park too. And, but at that time, yes, he wanted to create a green connection to the Taksim Square, but at that time, uh, private facilities such as Hotels, residents were constructed on that area. I'm sorry. Okay. And uh, if we, uh, and continuity of the park character was lost. The Republica Barrack proposed would have created another private island in the space if it was constructed. Okay. So, what happened? What are the Gezi Park protests? And construction protest uh, machines began to 
uh, remove trees in Gezi Park without any permit for construction, this sparkled protest not only in Istanbul, but throughout the country. In 2013, uh, while the protest continued, the administrative court ordered for the suspension of the uh, execution Taksim Barak project, and in 2013, the administrative court canceled the pedestrianization project. So I, I created a timeline. The process related to the approval, implementation, and cancellation of the project is quite overwhelming and long. Key points are defined in this timeline. Due to the, due to the time constraints, I cannot go in details of these events, but I can just put emphasis on several issues. Uh, the project was approved without existence of a design proposal, and in addition, the construction of the underground system tunnels were completed while the court case was in progress. So, uh, yes, I made some analysis. Before the construction, it was coincidentally, I, I didn't plan it, uh, before the construction, I had some uh, movement analysis. During and afterwards, these red dashed lines are just uh, the dates of the pedestrian observations that we conducted. Okay, currently Taksim Square sits a vast concrete space awaiting for a new urban design proposal and we are also expecting a landscaping implementation. So let's see what happened. So it was like that, the traffic, and it has changed some parties uh, during the construction and after the construction, you can see the uh, implementation of the project. Some part is uh, removed. What, what was the, the uh, main uh, morphological elements? Republic Monument is located. Gezi Park is surrounded by three major streets. And Gümüşsü has a curvilinear created uh, by Emilian Street. Gezi Park has a grid pattern in itself. Talim Hayane again has a grid pattern and is strongly connected to the rest of the area. Tarla Başı Bulvar is a major border. İstiklal Street constitutes a pedestrian spine of Beyoğlu and is another attractive connection in this area. So now I just have a look now uh, today, what is in 2019. So a construction of a Atatürk Cultural Center, it is under construction. If we just go to the piazza and look at that uh, photograph, uh, look at that uh, site, you can see obstructions, cars, some uh, limitations are uh, there. Construction of a mosque, it also started the mosque. And uh, again, if I take a photograph, you can see there are so many limit uh, borders uh, that pedestrians can't move. And there is a festival area and festival scene and open area and seating areas, okay, and the entrance of subway station, they are all blockages. They are blocking the pedestrian movement. They are separate islands at this moment. Uh, okay, let's look at the pedestrian. Uh, uh, okay, these are the methodology I use just for analyzing the shift of the uh, most integrated or most used streets, I should say. Uh, it was like that before, during the uh, Taksim Piazza is no more a piazza. It is a segregated space and after, if, you can, if we can create a space that is making a connection with the other parts of the uh, piazza and environment, then it can be integrated. Yes, it's waiting its proposal by thinking but, but not uh, using the delimited uh, separate islands, but connected areas. Visual connections are really necessary. I'm not going to explain all of these in detail. This is just a uh, close look, closer look. So let's now look for uh, pedestrian observations. What can we say? Uh, yes, we made calculations, and we understand that the total number of pedestrians were less now after the construction of these um, tunnels and so on. And if we just compare with men and women, we can easily say that it's a male dominant area. Uh, and we also found it necessary to conduct another round of observations in order to verify and confirm our conclusions. Both ground, underground counts, and followings are necessary at this point. Yes, there are more people on the underground 
So we can see that we can have this comparison. So uh, what, what about the conclusions? Yezi Park remains isolated in all phases observed and it can only be integrated to the remainder of the area by establishing stronger connections with, with its surroundings. The underuse of Gezi Park has long been the topic of debates. During the construction of the underground, May 2011 and September 2013, construction work did not heavily affect Gezi Park. And Gezi Park offered pedestrians a more convenient and direct option to get around compared to the rest of the area. Yet, yes, the findings of the research prove that Gezi Park is, is indeed very isolated from its surroundings. And also, okay. And also, when we uh, when we calculate the when we uh, have followings, when we follow people, we wanted to follow people, and uh, to understand which gates, which uh, which uh, streets they are using. And you can easily understand from this uh, figure that uh, the underground, uh, the gates of the underground stations and the streets around Gezi Park are mostly used by the followers. Although the spatial values in Taksim Square increased after the project was implemented, the pedestrian volume de declined. The latest round of observations confirmed that the pedestrianization project channeled the pedestrians who, is, who use the area for transit purposes down to the underground level. In summary, Taksim Square has undergone change as part of the spatial, political, and economic transformation of the city. However, the changes associated with pedestrianization project are unprecedented. It is evident that the construction of the underground level for transit purposes led to an undesired outcome and divided the users in Taksim Square in two. Below ground, who use the square for transportation purposes, are now channeled to the brand new Taksim below the ground level and above ground, the pedestrian level on the surface level decreased. It also did not offer any solutions to help Gezi Park become more connected. It is now impossible to revert Taksim to its original state. However, there certainly is a need for a design intervention on the surface level in order to improve the pedestrian levels. Further planning decisions and design and landscape in, uh, implementations are necessary. They can help to improve the pedestrian experience in Tex Taksim, make Gezi Park more integrated, and transform the Taksim above ground to become, to become a decent city square. So, now, to these questions. Uh, now, you can see Gezi Park protests before and after. It is quite normal if you feel confused when, look, when you look at these images. As the residents of the city, we feel equally confused when we look at the images. What is it about? I want to end my presentation with these images. Gezi Park protests, of course, make a turning point approach in the design proposal. But we can say that the design process became a puzzle game. We always have different uh, design proposals. Yes, we are, our municipality is trying to solve it, but it is not solved yet. It really needs a very hard work. So before it was a piazza with buildings, Barak, uh, Republica of Barak was there. And after that, it was a green space. Do we want to create a park in Taksim uh, area? Or do we want to create a square that we can come together, we can gather? Or do, do we want it to be just a passage to Istiklal Street? Or do you want this place to be a, a transportation hub, just a metro station? What do you want? What do you want Taksim to be? It's my question. Is it a political center? Is it a cultural center? Because we are going to have a new beautiful cultural uh, Atatürk Kültür Mar Merkez uh, is under construction. It was a nice, interesting building, but it, again, the son of the architect is also creating another interesting, and there is a mosque. Is it all, all going to be a place to pray? What do we want? This was my question. And uh, I really don't uh, know what our citizens want for this, uh, with this project. But I just want to emphasize again, it is, do you never stop in Taksim Piazza? 
Do you gather? Do you meet? Do you talk with your friends? Or you just pass through it? So that's my question. I think your answers will be very helpful to the municipality or to the architects, to the planners and designers to make a future urban design in this concrete space, just on uh, all less concrete space. Thank you for listening. Yeah. Can you please show us the, the results of the questionnaire of Aisha Sama Kubat Hoca? On the screen, please. Yes. Um, so, uh, on the... Okay. Or you can, please. Ah, okay. So, uh, what is the meaning of Taksim Square for you? Uh, it is just a meeting point. Yeah, it is just, it should be a meeting point. It is the heart of the piazza. Uh, it is the uh, visiting, visiting room of the city is more, I think, and also it is, what, it is that finance, finance, finance, finance. Yeah, no, it's the Istanbul, yeah, Istanbul's important finance center okay. has gotten 14 percent. Yeah. And Paris. down below, uh, it, it is that cultural. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we can't see actually which line belongs to which okay. answer. At least I can't understand it. Mm -hmm. Okay, I think it's a visiting room also important. And they say that I also it is a financial center. Okay. Okay, the line third from below, Hojam, mm -hmm. is actually answering that a cultural center by reconstruction of Atatürk Cultural Center, who, okay. which got 32%. Uh, okay, uh, yeah. okay. And the, the first answer, who got 30%, was so, open air meeting room of Istanbul, a place to meet and gather together. Okay, I'm very happy to hear that. <laughs> I hope we will have a design project. I, and I, I know that uh, the municipality is really very interested on the design of this beautiful area which is just the meeting uh, place of Istanbul. So thank you. Thank you for listening and thanks for the answering. Also, and there was another yes. question. How many times, how, how often do you visit Taksim Square? And uh, there are many people who are using once or twice a year. And also there are people uh, who are using once a week also. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for the answers and thank you for listening. Thank you, Hoca. Thank you, Aisha Samak Kubat-Kojam, for your interesting presentation as well. So uh, this presentation, again, underlines the problems of Taksim Square and Gezi Park. And apparently, Taksim will continue to be the subject of debates on account of its unresolved pedestrian and vehicle traffic. So now I will invite to floor Mahyar Araki for his speech. Um, he is an urban designer and professor of planning and landscape architecture at the University of Texas. And again, uh, introducing him would take too much of his time, so I will just make a very uh, short notice about his book, which gained two international awards, one in 2015, another one in 2019, uh, which is titled Deconstructing, Deconstructing Placemaking, Needs, Assets and Opportunities. It was a recipient of two international awards, as I just mentioned. So his um, speech today will be about informal urban design. And the question is, is it an oxymoron or a paradigm shift? In, in his speech, he will focus on why urban designers have remained largely reluctant or nonchalant about engaging in the informal settlement discourse. Thank you, Hoja. I think it's working. There is green light, but I don't know. Can you hear me? No. Mr. Kapala. Mr. Kapala. Thank you. 
Um, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, this brings back really great memories for me because I've been here before um, um, some years back. And, uh, and I really enjoy every time I come to Istanbul. It's, it's, it's fantastic. Um, and um, I was really impressed by the previous presentations and especially the second one because last night I was walking around Taksim Square and also Istiklal Jadisi and um, it was amazing. Uh, any time of the day, night, you go there, it's impressive. People are walking uh, around and you can actually, even though you may not understand what they're talking about, but it's, in tr it's truly international and diverse. So it's amazing. I think if uh, people who are, who are interested in the notion of public space can really get a lot of information just by walking, it's, it's enjoyable. But um, this is not what I'm going to talk about today. Um, in fact, I might be a little bit um, sort of out of place with the presentation because my presentation is not really about public space at all. Uh, as um, Dr. Mellis um, mentioned in my introduction, um, I was writing another book um, last year and it was published and um, the World Bank commissioned this project to me and uh, they asked me to uh, uh, go and do a research on informal settlements in Iran. And even though I was in the U.S. and I couldn't go to Iran um, because it was too far away and I had other things to do, so I had to do it through uh, secondary observation and secondary sources. So it was not an easy project. But I did it, and uh, I'm glad that it's out of the way. But when I did that project, uh, which was um, really about um, how the informal settlements or Gejikondus in Iran um, were actually empowered. It was about enablement and empowerment of the people who live in informal settlements. And after I finished that project, I was really, it dawned on me that why um, urban designers and planners to be, in, you know, very specifically, in my understanding are not really engaging with the question of informality. So that was my, that was a hunch that I had and I, even though I had finished the project, I said, hmm, I'm not really done with this yet. So I started working on this thing again and um, it's not working. Am I doing anything wrong? Oh, this one, okay, yeah. I'm sorry. So, um, so basically, what I'm really going to talk to you about today is that, um, in my opinion, um, there is a lot of, under, there, there's a lot of discussion, there's a lot of debate. Um, for those of you who are interested or are working as students or as professors or as practitioners, on urban design, different urban design issues. And there is a lot of talk, there's a lot of debate and discussion among urban designers and planners as to, and you, you can follow this in the literature, of course, you know, whether urban design is a field or is it a discipline or is it a profession? Is it part of planning? Is it part of landscape architecture? Is it neither of those things? Is it uh, something else? So there's that line of thought going on and then there's the uh, there's another interesting, uh, or uh, actually a, a number of debates going on in, in terms of, uh, you know, what is an integrative uh, urban design th theory? Because a lot of people believe that urban designers really almost are like icing on the cake. They do a little bit of that, a little bit of this. Um, are they in the business of just making the environment look nicer, or can they really make a difference in people's lives? So there is the, so that's why when they call it an integrative theory, it means uh, you know how do you integrate these seemingly disjointed or uh, disparate pieces of of things that professionals do. 
So what is that? So that's a discussion in, in and of itself. Then there is another discussion by others like, um, uh, for example, Madani Poor, who argues that there is something called a meaningful urban design. So uh, not every uh, urban design project is necessarily meaningful. So what makes it meaningful is uh, it has to be, for example, or uh, you know, uh, it has to be teleological, which means that it has to have a purpose behind it. It has to be catalytic. So you start off with something like Professor uh, Kubat was talking about, you know, Taksim Square, uh, whether it's for visitors, whether it's for people to come together or for other purposes. So you have a multiple of purposes, but in the end, can you really bring them together in a meaningful way? So that's also one discussion. Then there's another discussion, which is, you know, Madanipur calls it uh, ambiguity with urban design. And urban design is a very ambiguous field because it's a little bit of everything. And so uh, it's a question of scale, for example. What do urban designers do? Do they deal with the neighborhood? Do they deal with the entire city? Do they deal with the country? Do they deal with the region? So what is it? What, what scale is, is it that urban designers can really do something comfortably? So that's what, and the ambiguity of urban design is really, uh, has to do with that. Then there, there's, uh, of course, uh, others like Anne Vernes Moudon, who is a, a prominent professor of urban design in the uh, University of Washington, Seattle. She had a very uh, seminal paper many, many years ago in the 19, early 1990s, almost 27, 8 years ago, that she called it a Catholic approach to urban design, which means, again, uh, looking at, um, at urban design from a, a very um, a, uh, encompassing perspective. What is it that urban designers do? They don't, urban design does not have theories of its own. It borrows a little bit of theory from sociology, from landscape architecture, from uh, politics, you know, from geography. So, we, we, you know, so the reason I'm really telling you all this stuff is to tell you that uh, there is a lot going on uh, that urban designers are trying to, to find answers for. And um, so while all of this is going on for urban designers, my question was, well, on the side of urban design being a field or a profession or a discipline or whatever, or whether it has theories of its own or not, we have another problem. And whether we like it or not, we have these informal settlements. Um, then if you look at the literature of, urban, of informal settlements, there are people who argue that, um, you know, let's not talk about informal settlements. They're illegal anyway. You know, they're just outlawed. They break the law. So that's as simple as that. We don't want to deal with that. Then there are others, like uh, Professor Ananya Roy, who uh, taught at UCLA, and I think she's at Berkeley now, if I'm not mistaken. I, I don't remember, but I think she's not at UCLA anymore. And she used to believe that, um, that uh, informal settlements are unplannable, which means that if you're a planner, you really can't plan for informal settlements because they are unplannable to begin with. There's nothing plannable about them. So that's how she feels. And then there are others who also think that uh, let's not deal with them. You know, just time takes care of itself. Benign neglect. You just ignore them. They come to terms with their own difficulties and they can just, they manage their own uh, lives. And then there are others, uh, and I'm just trying to simplify things because, you know, I just want to get to the bottom of this. Um, and there are others who, again, think that there is this thing that uh, you as a planner call regulation. Everybody has to comply with regulations in a country, in a city. You know, we all abide by the law. And then there are others who think that, you know, regulation is just one way to deal with something. There is something else called regularization, not regulation. Regularization is to let time people catch up. If they've done something illegal, for example, for example, if you go to a neighborhood and you're, you're allowed to build only two story, a two-story building, 
And if you build a three-story building, that means that you've broken the law because you've added one more story, one more floor that you were not supposed to. Um, so you can either just tear it down, you know, as the matter of the law, because somebody can come and say, okay, you've, you've, you've built three floors. You were not supposed to build three floors. You were supposed to build two. So we're going to tear that one-story building down to make it uh, legal. And then there might be others who feel that, um, you know, let's just, let's just find them, get the money, money helps the municipality, and then just let them live their lives. So all of these things are, are, are again, are happening um, with informal settlements. So there's not like a one-size-fits-all treatment. There are, other, there are many people who think that uh, we have to deal with informal settlements in their own way. We can bulldoze them, we can get rid of them, or we can help people to help themselves. So there are a lot of different discussions going on. And, and, um, but if I want to go back to the initial question that I set out to you guys that, okay, what is the role of urban designers in all of this big question of informality? Um, then uh, when I was uh, thinking about this question that why aren't uh, urban designers really engaging with the question of, of, of informality, as much as they should be, then I realized that as urban designers, if you, if you go to Itu, for example, or if you go to Metu or other places in Turkey or in other countries and want to study urban design, you will be trained. You will get a training as an urban designer. So you will have to be really good at sketching and planning. You probably are an architect before you became an urban designer. And uh, at the end of the day, after your training is over, you are really going to be good at th in three things. You're going to be good at zoning. You know, urban planners and urban designers are really good because when, they, when you plan for an, uh, an environment, for example, we saw that in the, pre in the previous presentation around Taksim Square, Professor Kubat was, was explaining that there is zoning law. There is a, a very, very meticulous way of regulating the spatial environment. So that's regulation. So you have to know what the regulations are. Uh, and you have to comply with them. So the th second thing that I think urban designers are really trained at uh, doing is that, like I said, they have to create beautiful environments. That's aesthetics. You know, it has to be visually appealing and visually um, nice. It has to look nice. And then the third thing, which probably could be the first thing, is that if you are an urban designer, you are good at designing. You design, that's your urban design. So you design the environment. So in my opinion, if I want to really uh, outline three things that I think urban designers are good at doing is that they have to create an environment that is legal, regulation, you know, you set up your zoning codes or zoning ordinances, that's regulation then your environment at the end of the day has to look nice, that's aesthetics. And of course the third one is that you have to be able to design well. And um, so now going back to what I was doing in the Iranian project, which I did, was that I um, tried to get some examples from um, five cities that the, that the World Bank uh, was actually uh, giving me some information so that I can finish my book. And um, when I was looking at all these, um, you know, it, I realized that, you know, not necessarily everything with regards to informal settlements uh, is bad. Uh, people actually, because if you read the literature on informal settlements, you read that people have low education, they are poor, they are criminals, uh, they are violent, this, this, and that. So when I read that, it said, yeah, you know, you cannot really push and, and compartmentalize and, and classify and group people into really all of these big categories. There might be exceptions. And when I tried to dig deeper into one of the cities in this city, Kermanshah in Iran, I realized that 
all these poor people in this particular you know, neighborhood in that city, I realized that um, they were poor, they were very, they had very low education, but what they did was that they, as a group of people, they got together and they set up this trash recycling um, sort of business for themselves. So some of them were like picking up trash from, um, from around the neighborhoods of, of the city of Kermanshah, and they were, you know, trying to uh, uh, group the plastics, the plastic stuff, the bottles, uh, they separated them from papers, from other types of trash, and then they packed them in bags and they tried to go and recycle them. And I thought, that is positive, that's a good thing. So not all of the people who live in informal settlements are necessarily criminals, I mean, they're doing something good. So that's when I decided that there's something wrong here that urban designers should really get, get involved with this. So this is just a, a part of the argument that says not necessarily, not everybody who lives in these places are bad or they do bad things. So that's one example. The other thing was that in Dolatabad, which was another neighborhood in this city, um, uh, I think planners, that was really something uh, interesting. A planner came and, or a group of planners came and uh, tried to do their job, they had this, uh, they designed something and then they designed these homes that were really, that had large lots to begin with. And because they had large lots, that means that uh, poor people could not afford buying them. So then I, I was told that a group of, another group of people went and, tr and subdivided these large lots into smaller lots so that they become affordable and people can afford them and buy them. And that's when these lots started to be bought off by, by people. Otherwise, when they were designed as large lots, nobody could afford them. So that was another way of, of, of making sense to me that, that um, if you do something as a planner, if you do it wrong, then people are not going to be on board with you and you have to make some changes. So these are all the good, good examples or for example in another case like what you see here which is another way of like maybe talking about public space perhaps is that the people who lived in this neighborhood in Bandar Abbas which is another city in Iran uh, they realized that uh, there was a really stinky bad odor coming off of the um, you know these streets and people who were living in these informal settlements, they went to the municipality and they told the mayor that, why don't you do something about this? And the mayor said, well, you know, you're illegal. You're, you're not part of the city. You're, you're not um, part of the regular uh, re legal city. So the people, the women actually in that neighborhood uh, came together and went and actually took care of some of the uh, problems that they had in terms of service runoff and the sewer system and everything and they took care of it. So when I saw these examples, and of course there are more examples, but anyway, and, and I don't want to get into that, but I'm just telling you that not necessarily everything that is happening in informal settlements are bad. So going back to my own original question, my question was how can urban designers really get involved with the question of informal settlements? And in order to answer that question, because I, I turned this into a book, a book that is, I'm still working on, it's almost done, but I used three analogies in that book, or three metaphors, if you will. One is that, I don't know if you guys are familiar with these, but the first metaphor that I'm using is the wicked problems versus tame problems. This is a very famous analogy for, for some of you who may have studied planning, uh, Rittel and Weber, uh, the two famous American professors, they came up with this analogy and they all said that planning problems are typically wicked. That means that they're very hard to pinpoint. A planning problem is a problem that before you say, okay, it's economic or it's social or it's cultural or it's spatial and physical, it really changes its nature. So one day is physical, tomorrow it may become 
cultural, day after that it may become an economic problem. So it's very hard to pinpoint and say the, re the reason or the cause for this is only physical or it's only economic or it's only social. That's why it's called wicked because you cannot really put your finger and say, okay, this is the cause of the problem. Then anyway, so in my opinion, informal settlements do not really, um, you cannot apply this metaphor of wicked, even though wickedness is a metaphor for planning problems, but in my opinion, um, I don't think you can apply that to informal settlements because informal settlements have all kinds of problems. They're, they have legal problems, they have physical problems, they have social problems, they have educational problems, they have every kind of problem. So to me, we have to find another way of, if we, if we want to use an analogy, I don't think wicked problems can do the job. The second thing, the second metaphor that I think just kind of unravels a little bit uh, this, this dilemma of informality is, um, uh, I like this, is a puzzle versus a mystery. And the way I can explain this to you is that um, uh, uh, this, this, this gentleman, this guy by the name of Gladwell, he had a very nice analogy that he said, some things are, some, some things are, are uh, puzzles, and some things are mysteries. And the difference between the two is that the puzzle, for a puzzle, you need information. But for a mystery, you don't need information. You need good judgment. And I think uh, informal settlement is one of those things that for that, you need good judgment. You don't need necessarily information. And the difference between the two, in case you are wondering, what is the difference between you know, judgment versus good information? Uh, Gladwell actually uh, believes that when, when uh, he, he had a very interesting story to tell. He said when bin Laden was, you know, when the US, U.S. government was looking for bin Laden, they had a lot of intel, a lot of, had a lot of information. Finally, with good information, they found him. But when, so that's the puzzle. For, for the puzzle, you need information. But for mystery, you don't know what's going to happen. Information is not enough. So for, for a mystery, the, the example he gave for mystery was that he said when Saddam Hussein in Iraq was overthrown, nobody knew the Iraq after the overthrow of Saddam Hussein is going to be what? Is going to be democratic, is going to be another you know, government like him. So that's what a mystery is. Nobody knows what is going to happen after that. So that's the difference between a mystery and a problem. And in my opinion, I think urban design is something like that. So I know my time is up. I'm just telling you that for urban designers to be good urban designers, they have to know the difference between a puzzle and a, uh, and a mystery. And, uh, and the last point that I want to make is that they have to be foxes, not hedgehogs. That's the last uh, analogy. Foxes can do many things. Hedgehogs can only do one thing, and that one thing is design. So I think if we want to be successful in dealing with informal settlements, we have to act like foxes and not like hedgehogs. I know I'm over, so thank you very much for... Um, so I will invite all the speakers of this session uh, to the floor. And by the way, um, Mahyar Arefi had uh, a questionnaire already uh, prepared for this session, and I see that you have answered his questions as well. Maybe we can also join uh, this, uh, the, the results of his questionnaire with the question which was targeted to him. I see here a question which is targeted to you also through the online system. Um, the question is that what makes a Gege Kondo? Is the problem really what makes the Gege Kondo a Gege Kondo or is it the central government in the problem of Gege Kondo? So opening up the question, is it a social problem or a governmental or governance problem? The question was like that, so maybe you can interpret the results of the survey by answering this question. Sure. And I will give you maybe just two more minutes. Sure. Um, but I was, uh, I was just 
trying to see the results. I don't have an answer for like, um, this is, what, what is the English translation of that? The I just translated it to you. Because he wants the English, okay. to see the English. Um, I don't think that they can translate it immediately. This is what I just... Right, okay. This is about uh, uh, scratcher settlements, you right. asked. So, I mean, I don't have an answer for this right now, but I think this is an, the, the general observation that you made is, is very good. That's what I wanted to know. Um, and I didn't want you to, to be affected by my own uh, premises, so that's, that's good to know. I think it's a little bit of everything, like I said. I cannot say it's economic or social or physical. I think it's all of the above. But, I, but like I said, I think urban designers have to be more than just doing good design and doing uh, beautiful design and um, you know very good designers. I think they have to be able to do many things. They have to understand if, for example, if women in the neighborhood can go and you know uh, do something good about their public space, that's great. That's the job of the urban designer to know that those women, if they if you give them the opportunity, they can go and make their environment better. So I think that's the, um, that's the important thing that we have, to, we have to think like foxes, not like hedgehogs. I guess that's, that's my answer. Thank you. Uh, I think your microphone is open, so I can't. Who? Yours. Mine? Yeah. yeah so you can just turn oh. it off. Thank, thank you. you. OK. So uh, thank you for your answer. So we have another um, question for Ayşe Sema Kubat through the uh, online uh, question survey. So if we can just also display it on the screen. However you like. Shall I answer in Turkish or English? The Taksim Square and Gezi Park, you explained their situation in the past and, in the, uh, and today. So how is it going to be in the future? How will it influence the Talabashi Boulevard? That was my question. I was trying to understand because uh, I showed you some photos and I'm curious to know what's going to happen next. Right now, it's just you know somewhere to pass that will enable you to reach Istiklal Street or Taksim Square, but it is with uh, interruptions. It's uh, with in, uh, isolated uh, aisles or islands. It should be integrated, in my own opinion. It should be the kind of place where we can stop and talk and socialize. It shouldn't only be for passing. It should also be a social area that we can live. And my work also handles the environment, and we need to have relationships with the environment. Talabashi definitely uh, has an influence, but it has a problem that it creates that has to do with traffic. The opening of the Talabashi Boulevard was something that happened a long time ago, and it could be integrated with the Istiklal Street or with Talimhane and Gezi Park. There should be a continuity. I would really uh, enjoy to see that happening, but for this we would need a lot of design work. Landscape uh, planners, urban planners, engineers, architects need to work together. A lot of disciplines would need to sit together and work on it in detail. And perhaps a concours is going to happen in Taksim Square. Vedat Dalokai, perhaps you remember, uh, won uh, an award about this in the past, but it was not implemented and it's disputable whether it was the best solution, but we should consider it from today's point of view and uh, make sure that the connections with the metro exits are fine and uh, it should be the uh, living room of Istanbul where we host our guests. It's not some place that we should run through, it should be an area where we can gather and socialize and for this it's really important that it has strong relations with the surrounding areas. Thank you very much. This question uh, is regarding to all of the presenters of this session. Um, if you can also display it on the uh, screen, please. I will try to translate it. It was a, a Turkish written one. So um, for designing um, livable public spaces for all, how much do you think the historians and sociologists should be involved in the process? So the question was like that. I think, yeah. 
Okay, maybe starting from you, Mark. Uh, um, personally, um, I think it's a very straightforward contemporary answer. It's, uh, it's not about history, it's about now. It's about what we're doing as public today, and the ownership is the public. It's not destined or designed by a specific government body. Uh, Taxim Square, for example, is sort of possibly the most significant party that happened there was when the actual ownership was taken over by general public of Turkey. Um, that itself, I think, gives it a, gen a general atmosphere of not being governed, not being designed specifically, but actually populists having the ability to commune, communicate, and utilize it for their own benefit and their own good. Um, possibly that's future making in terms of ideology, and um, how that is governed, I think, is very difficult because times change very, very quickly. Uh, would you like to add something? Um, I do agree with Mark and what is the purpose of kind of contemporary people, except if there is a sort of um, um, important building culturally that needs to be reserved, etc. Um, yeah, uh, there's certain sort of voice of historians may come in, but I don't know whether the, the, sort of the percentage of involvement of historians, apart from that sort of a learning the background of the uh, place, is okay that in terms of a kind of collaboration um, or just consultation may happen, but um, yeah, I mean, I don't know the percentage. I, I, I would say it's, yeah, it's very a little, but um, not, not zero. Just in terms of what happens is in, within the UK now, um, and also across the world, there's statues, there's, cel there's celebrations of historical kind of moments in history that are now totally not relevant, and our people are protesting to take those things away. We should be dealing with what society requires today. Okay, uh, do you have, yeah. I want to say, I want to add something. Uh, it depends, uh, of course, in all cases, the sociologists and the historians should take place, of course. But it depends on which uh, piazza you are interested or you are designing. For example, in uh, Beyazıt Square, if we are talking about Beyazıt Square, it is just in the center of the historical peninsula, uh, where one of the uh, Byzantium forums was uh, once there. Underneath, there, is, there are archaeological heritages. So there should be archaeologists involved in this design of Beyazıt Square. It's really important because we have Byzantine heritage down below and the upper floor we have, uh, below we have Ottoman heritage. So this, should, this for example, this um, square should be, or Hagia Sophia Square, uh, they all be uh, studied by historians, archaeologists. It depends. <laughs> Uh, which uh, piazza you are interested, which piazza you are designing. But in all cases, if you are in Istanbul, uh, historians always should take place, and also the sociologists, because we are creating a design for pedestrians, for people who are living there or using as a tourist. Sociologists, psychologists, they are always involved when there is a human being we are talking about. So, of course, they should be involved. But the percentage depends how much, according to the question, depends which piazza we are, we are dealing with. Thank you, Hojan. Uh, is there anything that you would like to add? I don't know, mine is. Mine is. Yeah, I, I, I also agree. I think that it's not a matter of uh, defining or you know, giving a certain number. I think in. Uh, sociologists and historians are always involved and should be involved uh, as I think Heidegger said you know it's always a matter of you know we are always in the process of from going from being to becoming so public spaces and spaces are always in the transformation of being something else so for that to happen I think the people are important uh, you know uh, the bottom-up urbanism the participation of the people is important and sociologists know that uh, it's the what's important is that the planner knows how to coordinate and bring all of these different uh, fields of, of, of areas of expertise together. So sociologists, so, you know, it's an interdisciplinary situation. So somebody has to be able to bring all these people on board and collaborate and, and try to coordinate among them. But their participation is absolutely necessary. So thank you. Um, we started quarter past 10, so I believe that we have 10 more minutes. 
which will leave us space for three more questions. If there are questions from the audience who might like to raise a hand and ask to the presenters any comments, you are welcome. I think you can ask in Turkish, of course, uh, that there will be a translation. You say that Taksim Square was now isolated from the surroundings and it's always being criticized for being uh, elevated. Have you made any conclusions about the influence of this? Are you speaking about the Gezi Park? Yes. Uh, recently, they tried to make a connection using stairs. There were some stores there. They were all cleared. And a connection was built by means of stairs. I think the elevation might add value if it's used in a positive way. I think it's effective. However, uh, perhaps you have seen Trafalgar Square, it was completely isolated, but then uh, they designed uh, nice stairs, which made it very livable and vivid. We failed to do the same in Gezi Park with the stairs. There was a photo showing this, but I had to skip it really fast and then I was uh, regretting it. When you go to Gezi Park, there are barricades and then there are police cars. It's impossible to go in. So between Taksim Square and Gezi Park, there are stairs for connection, but now it's not possible to pass uh, the security. Perhaps it's because of uh, the process that we're in, but uh, it's insulated, it's, it's isolated anyway. It's always isolated. Gezi Park is always isolated from the rest of the area, and how we can connect it is an important design question. And the main reason why we are unable to solve the problem is the security issues, in my opinion. And I placed the photo there as well, but I had to go past, so you might not have seen it. Perhaps we can see the presentation once again, because we have time, anyway. It might be like slide number 29 or 30. Um, and while we are waiting for the presentation, maybe if there are any other questions, um, comments to the speakers? It's not working. About Taxi Square and Gezi Park, there is a project uh, which was used that was designed by the Greater Municipality of Istanbul. I wish Yasin Chata was also here because then this question would be more meaningful. The engineer or the landscape artist, the landscape engineer should explain why they designed it this way. They use water in urban space, it must have a function, an aesthetic function or otherwise. We should understand why water was used. There, are, there is some vegetation used. I want to know what the vegetation was used for. There was a project built by the Greater Municipality. We haven't seen it. We haven't seen it because it was not used. The one who made the project must explain the design. A few years ago, I asked this question to some colleagues in the Greater Municipality, and they said the project was built by someone who was quite renowned for his design project. Between Gezi Park and Taksim Square, there is no integration, no connection. The the problem regarding the elevation was only solved by means of stairs. There are many people, like students for instance, even when you ask 
students, they don't know whether there's a path there or not. It's just a hard uh, floor. There are some sitting areas, but nobody is using them. There's a metro connection where there's water. We don't know why water was used there. We don't understand. The texture and relevant elements were used excessively. The space becomes even smaller. It shrinks. It's uh, really not well maintained. I wish that we had someone from Greater Municipality to explain this, because we could see in press and media that the new administration was going to start a competition about the Taksim Square and a better design was going to be made. But first we need to understand the existing design and with the involvement of the public, with the people, we should redesign the area. This was just a practice designed by a landscape artist. That's what we are using at the moment. Thank you very much. Thank you. The subject is not only about Taksim Square, it was public spaces in general. And I talked about this uh, study I made about Taksim. I wish there was a subsection about Taksim Square alone. Uh, we found that before, but uh, it got lost again somehow. Uh, I wish the architects were here. I agree with you, you have a point. Uh, the, I, I was told that the project was not complete yet. Uh, when I completed my survey, it was 2015, 2016. I'm still waiting for the Taksim Square project to take place so that I can compare it to my own methods. I wish that it was offered to the public. Uh, I wish uh, we could discuss it, but the subject is not only Taksim Square, but pu public spaces in general. So we cannot speak about what's missing at the moment because we, the right people are not here anyway. I wish they were here. But the subjects uh, were announced. I wish they were here to support, but uh, that's all. Earlier, we had a slide. I want the, the photo I wanted to show you was this one. When we climb up the stairs in Gizi Park, when we exit, the first thing we come across is the police. The barrier is created by the police. This creates a sense of limitation or confinement. This was done on purpose. We don't always see what the designer or the planner did implement it. There are different implementations uh, handled by different people and we are waiting for the concours to open and for Taksim Square to be reorganized. And while waiting for the remote, I can again from the audience if there are any. System. Yeah, please. Can, can, can someone explain to me as a visitor to, to Istanbul why the police is still in position now to create such an atmosphere in Taksim Square? So, are you asking this to the audience? <laughs> <laughs> okay, is there anyone from the audience who would like to answer his question? Mark's question. Would you repeat your question after turning on your microphone because it wasn't heard. The microphone was off. I'm kind of interested as a I'm kind of interested as a foreigner coming to yes. Istanbul about the presence of the police in Taksim Square, exactly what you say, making it actually feel very, very oppressive in terms of wanting to actually use the space and the navigation through the square, and also actually wanting to be participant within the square with family and friends. So why, why is there such presence, such an austere presence within the square to this day? And I do think this has got Fox and the Hedgehog story related to it as well. Mm. That, that, that feels like there's a Hedgehog scenario going on here. You're right. I think there is no one from the audience, but Aisha Semakubat uh, uh, might I can answer. say uh, it's just a political issue because uh, the green space. We want uh, more parks in our uh, in our uh, environment, 
and we didn't want to remove uh, the most of the some of the young people and the students the architects the planners didn't want to lose this green character if we, if we just bring a barrack over there and uh, a republic of barrack then the uh, piazza will be segregated again so they don't want it, but uh, the government wants it. And it was always a political center. There were so many events happened in Taksim Square. And because of that, it is always the uh, place for political events. If you, if you look back to the history, you will see that uh, there were many, many uh, problems occurred, many, uh, many uh, happenings. Many people were killed once upon a time. And so it is the place where we have political affairs in the historical periods. And this uh, Gezi Park uh, is another idea. The government wants something, and some people want it, and the others didn't want it. So this was a, an, another issue, and they want their green spaces to have more green spaces in Istanbul. And this was some, some of the uh, people, some of the citizens want the barrack to be. Uh, placed, but uh, and uh, some people were. I also explained before the project was uh, approved without the existence of a design proposal, and the construction of the underground system and tunnels were completed while the court case was in progress. And uh, this was the issue. Uh, it can happen in all cities, but this was a very uh, because of that, it is the place for political affair affairs. Your microphone is off. Thank you, sir. Just to add, in terms of public ownership uh, and public space, even though it's political still now with the historical understanding, don't you think that's way more important in terms of ownership and story making and actual understanding public communication within our contemporary times, rather than the idea that it's not getting used and this oppressive image that it's given out beyond Istanbul? No, it, like um, maybe this because this is a very uh, issue which requires a long time to make a conversation about, and it is a um, hot issue in Turkey as well, especially for urban planners, for as well as for politicians, as well as for the citizens of Istanbul, as you just mentioned. So maybe talk over this issue over the coffee break. Okay. Okay. And um, so, therefore, I would like to um, thank all the presenters and speakers today on behalf of you. And I would like to thank you on behalf of all the speakers and myself for listening and participating in the questionnaires and asking questions and commenting. Um, so, we, I am closing this session now. Okay, thank, thank you. you.